Hello and welcome to a very special episode of the Breaking Muscle Podcast, where we bring you unique insights and viewpoints from the leaders of change in the fitness industry. I am Pete Hitzeman, Managing Editor of BreakingMuscle.com, and hosting today's show is our regular contributor and kettlebell padawan, Justin Lind. Every good thing in your life is about relationships, and that includes fitness. Nobody can illustrate this point better than Dr. Chris Holder, head strength and conditioning coach at Cal Poly and a longtime contributor to Breaking Muscle. He and Justin dive into his athletic and coaching careers, uncovering the family tree of coaches who shaped who he is today. Under their tutelage, Dr. Holder learned to actively adapt his coaching philosophy to meet the unique needs of his athletes, as illustrated by his new partnership with David Weck. A consistent theme you'll hear in this interview is Dr. Holder's willingness to be the first to try new things. This manifested in the evolution of his coaching methods toward the primacy of kettlebell training, which he feels has given his teams the edge over their competitors for more than 15 years. His curiosity also led to his introduction to and education in Qigong, and he discusses the impact it has had on himself and his athletes at Cal Poly. Enjoy. Cool. I'm sitting here with Chris Holder, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo. This is a special interview for me because he's becoming a great friend and also becoming a special mentor. And before we even launch into your your story and some of the work that we've done together and all the other things that you're doing, um, I just like to bookend these talks with kind of a personal motto of mine that is always something to work on, but always something to celebrate. And it's it's balancing that that growth mindset with with um, some gratitude and like to start with what's something in your personal journey that you are really working on in yourself for myself I when I started out in the strength world and lifting weights and doing all that good stuff I was obsessed I loved it and and, and there's a piece of me that still is obsessed but as you know as you get older and and, and parenthood and, and, and being a husband and a full-time coach and all of that stuff, certain things tend to get pushed aside. And for me, my fitness has been one of those things. I have let I have let everything else get a precedent on that. And there's a part of me now, almost 42 years old, who's, you know, that nine-year-old in the aisle way at the, the Alpha Beta grocery store looking at my muscle first muscle magazine and being completely mesmerized what was on the pages. That, that kid's still alive and still wants to be recognized. So for me right now, believe it or not, I know this is a, this is a podcast about fitness and strength and stuff. But for me, it's, it's going to be the, just getting back on the, 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 the physical improvements. I mentally and my spiritual side are always dialed because I continually refine that piece of myself. It's time to get my body back to, to where I want it to be. And then that, in, It'll take on various different things. I crossfitted for a very short time in 2000 and I guess it would be 12 and loved it. Yeah. So there's a, there's a crossfitter who wants to be recognized here. (laughs) So we'll see. But that, that's for me, it's going to be my, my own physical journey now is, is going to have to start taking a priority. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's good to once in a while re, recommit to that. Yes. You know, I've had a, um, a coaching mentor of mine say that you know every day you have as a coach you have two jobs and that's bring it be 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 everything that you can be for your athletes and number two is train yourself get, right. those are your main two jobs every day right um, and I'm the same way that it's it's so easy to focus on everything else sure. and like you said kind of the uh, emotional spiritual side never never seems to completely fall by the wayside yeah um, but that own physical piece it's just you know, you spend all day in a gym. Sometimes you're just anxious to leave. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there's, for me, especially with the emotional and the spiritual side of things, I think some of any hangups that I may have in that area would be completely solved if my body was where I wanted it to be. You know what I mean? It's, sure. it's, it's that, it's that um, developing the whole person piece. Yeah. And I know we're going to get into the Qigong talk and we're going to get into to some of my more abstract ways of thinking about things. But we look at the body as, you know, three separate, completely different entities. You've got the physical body, the emotional body, and the spiritual body. And if you're not pampering all three, then you, you tend to, to, you tend to have nothing. You, right. you need to nurture all three pieces. And so, um, I know for myself, once my fitness gets where I, to where I want it to be, um, even those other areas are going to improve. Absolutely. It's, um, it's very much an all or nothing thing. And even, yeah, even the commitment, if it's like when I, when I am being really dedicated about 
my training, you're inevitably eating better. You're inevitably going to bed earlier. You're writing and some of the other work, the programming, you're more on top of things. It's just like, it's, 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 it's kind of the, it's the gateway into like having some commitment spread throughout the rest of your life. Sure. Um, and yeah, that's cool. I mean, what are, I guess we don't have to get too far into it. I was just going to say like, what are, what are some of the things that were happening in your life that made you realize that you needed to recommit to that? Well, the practice what you preach thing is big. Yeah. It's really, really big. I'm fortunate enough that being just a big guy works in my setting because, you know, you've got football players around and all that stuff. And I've, right. I've been in places where the strength coach were actually just smaller dudes or, um, you know, what have you. And there's a, there's a, there's a missing piece for them. They have to fight and they have to be louder and they have to, yeah, they have to do something above and beyond that I don't have to necessarily do because I'm just a big dude. I'm an old offensive lineman. Uh, if you saw me in a grocery store and didn't see the the gray in my hair, you you said, "What sport did that guy play?" They just said, well, "He looks like a football player." So I mean, I still have kind of that look about me. So the practicing what you preach part is really really important to me because when I played, I was I was really strong. I mean, I I, I still hold records at, at at schools that I played at that haven't been touched yet, yeah. and some lifting records, lifting records, yeah, yeah. and um, I you know those are <laughs> the old football guy and still thinks about those things and yeah. so and right now I'm I'm not even in the same county as that guy you know what I mean yeah. and I would like to get cl- close to that again yeah so absolutely practice what you preach the, the kids need to see the investment you're putting in so that when you ask them to do something that's awful and painful and, and, and you know push their boundaries that they somewhere in the back of the recesses of their subconscious they're like yeah I've seen him do this too that's right really really embodying yeah. uh, what Com- it is that we talk about completely yeah that's um that's beautiful. So I guess I guess that leads into kind of the first thing I want to talk about. I feel like most most people in in the in the training world have something something that we're trying to accomplish, or there was something that led us into the coaching and the teaching, and just just feeling like you have a message or a mission or something that you're trying to put into the world. And I'm wondering if you've thought about that and what you feel like you're you're trying to offer. As a as a coach, um, you know, I, you would think somebody who walks around with all this preachy spiritual stuff would have a really good answer for this one. And you know, for for me, and you, and you know, you've read some of the things that I've written, and you've, um, I'm big on relationships. I was a, I had a, I have a really interesting football experience because um, I've played for a lot of really incredible people, and. My offensive line coach at my junior college is a guy that I still communicate with to with to this day. He's somebody I would take a bullet for to this day. Yet my strength and conditioning, or not my strength and conditioning coach, but my offensive line coach when I was in college in my four year, he and I never had rapport. Yeah. We never had a bond of any kind, and and it, and it was really tough for me to go from one side of the spectrum to the opposite side. Um, because I, I, I so valued Coach Martinez as a guy at my junior college that I played for. Coach Martinez is a guy that, you know, you know he's, he's amazing, and he invested a ton of time in me and personally. We used to actually be lifting partners. Yeah. Junior college is a little looser than normal four-year colleges and stuff, and that was, that was one of the ways that he and I developed the bond that we still have. And so when I had um, this other offensive line coach, he was just one of these guys who worked in a silo. He was... Uh, he had a couple of the guys that were close to him, but for the most part, it was just a bunch of yelling and pointing fingers and telling you what you're doing wrong. <laughs> and I did not respond well to that. Um, and I think my play suffered as a result of that. And I will take my fair share of the responsibility of in letting that become a problem. But um, the 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 idea for me is relationships. And what I mean by that is when these athletes leave, I want them to have had such a such a hallmark experience for them in their lives to where we're invited to weddings and all that stuff and I'm not trying to be still be a part of their life but what I want them to do is I want them to always look back on the weight room time and it being very like a fond memory for them and we've, and we've been doing that for a long time now I get a text message I'm, I'm Dave Matthews band obsessed <laughs> and for a lot of years when Chris White was here we would just play Dave Matthews that's all we would put on and it was because it was back in the CD days I would put in six Dave CDs and we would just loop them all day long. <laughs> and when I tell you, Justin, all day, I mean literally all day, okay? <laughs> all day, every day. 
but I'll have kids that'll text me who who graduated 15 years ago and say, you know, coach, I was driving to work and crashed into me, came on, and I was immediately just, you know, shuttled back to the weight room, transported back yeah. to all of our time together. And those are the things that you live for. And that, that there's there's people in the world that you've been with, you've spent time with, and then you've also done things with it was it's it sucked for them and at times. I mean, you know, you push their you push their limits, and they thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, one of my closest friends on earth is a kid who. Um, he's not a kid anymore. He's a grown man with kids and family and stuff. <laughs> he was in my wedding, and he's one of these guys who I think our relationship here in the weight room is what kept him going and what kept him playing and what kept his head in it because he knew that if he were to step away from football that he would lose this aspect just by virtue of we're not allowed to let randoms come in here. Right. And so um, it's all about relationships. It's all about people. Um, every... Uh, Every good thing that happens in your life, whether it be the people that you love or the friends that you have or the relation, you know, it's all about those relationships. It's not, you know, I've only been a couple places alone in my life that are, you know, I went to Ireland by myself and it was an amazing experience, but it's because I needed to go there and be there and on that land and do that stuff. But every fond memory I've ever had, there's people there and there's, there's role players in there. And if one of those people was missing, it wouldn't have been the same experience. So for me, it's about relationships. Yeah. Long answer. No, that's that's great. I I couldn't agree more. I mean, everything. If if you if you have the right people around you, yeah. then any anything else that 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 follows is gonna is gonna be okay. Right. Everything is kind of built on that. Agreed. Um, and I couldn't I couldn't agree with that answer more. And you know, it's something that I wanted to ask you about a little bit later in this, but it seems it seems like the natural time to bring it up one of my favorite pieces that you have ever written was paying homage to some of your mentors yeah and just 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 the gratitude um but also just the recognition that um we all we all are uh shaped in so many ways by the by the people that we have had in our lives either by chance or by choice and um recognizing that and also paying some gratitude to those people so um, I guess just like what are what are some of those people, and maybe maybe just a couple things that you that you have really taken away from each of them, or like things that really define um, your life every day. You know, yeah. I, I know there's got to be a couple big moments in there. There are, there are, and and the thing that, that strikes me that is the most profound is I'll be you know I'll be on the weight room floor doing whatever, teaching whatever exercise, and I'll say something, and I'll consciously think to myself, "Ooh, that was." That was that was Coach Berger. Ooh, that was Coach Kent. You know what yeah. I mean? I could feel them kind of almost like channeling. It's them. almost like their voice is coming through. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, my my mentors. I've got a lot of guys that I credit for for creating. You know what what I do. Um, my first big mentor is a guy named Mike Kent. He's the head strength coach at Florida right now. Um, he's the one that that created the co- college coach version of me. So much so that when I you know finally got my first gig when I was alone. I was trying desperately, almost like I was, you know, like an actor trying to be him. Yeah. And it didn't work because, of course, he's this short little redheaded old guy that screams <laughs> and yells, you know what I mean? And that's kind of not been my deal. But um, I spent a lot of years trying to be just like him. And then when I kind of found my own stride, it was good. Coach Ken is seriously the foundation. He is he's 70% of what I am right now. Um, Mike Bergner, he's got um, the whole CrossFit weightlifting Right. thing by the by the throat right now <laughs> um he's my olympic weightlifting mentor i did a lot of like certifications with him back in the old days when he was with usaw where it was just he and i yeah um got to spend a lot of great quality time with him um and he if you've never been around coach b you, you just understand that he's 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 iconic and it's not because of crossfit and stuff like that you just watch him coach yeah. and you watch him own the room when when Coach Bergner talks, you can hear a pin drop. And it's because everybody in the room knows. They can feel it. They understand that there's something profound is about to be said. And he he's the one that showed me kind of how to operate in terms of taking the room and getting everybody completely locked in on you and, and, and learn how to how to speak. And it was just purely it wasn't he didn't teach me those things. I just watched him and and, and saw what he was doing and um, it kind of comes through a little bit as, as I'm doing this stuff. And, of course, the, the Olympic weightlifting is a big part of um, our program here at Cal Poly. Right. He's actually the one that introduced me to the idea of the kettlebells. 
he was I, I was repeat visits in December back to to do assist with him at the USAWs. And one of those weekends, he was like, you know, hey, I need you to take a look at this. And we've been doing some stuff here at the high school where he was working. I'm not sure if he's actually still doing that. He's probably not doing that gig anymore. But, um, you know, he's, he, he had just had some sort of uh, side research that he'd been doing with kettlebell swings and all the stuff. And all these football kids were having these amazing leaps in strength. And truthfully, the only difference was he was adding kettlebell stuff in um, because his Olympic stuff stayed constant. All of his, 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 you know, the standard compound barbell stuff was all the same stuff. He was just putting kettlebells in. He's like, you really need to look at this. And I was like, oh, okay, coach. And then kind of blew him off. And then the following December, I had back, and the first thing out of his mouth is, did you go do this kettlebell thing? And I was like, you know, tail between my legs. No, sir, I didn't. And, and you know, he, in the most eloquent way, he, he gave me my tongue lashing that I probably deserved. And <laughs> so that next April, I was on a plane blindly I'd swung kettlebells one time with him um, up here in San Luis Obispo he's down in like the San Diego area right. um, he came up here and, and did a little light clinic I swung kettlebells one time with him it's like okay, I don't know what this is about but if Coach B says it's what I need to do then that's what I need to go do that's right got on a plane and spent my three days at the RKC this is back in 03 or 04 yeah, back in uh, the hell days <laughs> well just yeah just back in the days where it was just it was it, we were the RKC was super aggressive back then and Brett Jones was my uh, team leader at the time Pavel of course was the the, the, the icon um, and it was an amazing weekend it was one of those transformative weekends where you're like holy cow um, this is something big and Coach B was right and so uh, I came back and I did the exact same thing that Coach Bergner had done. I started employing kettlebells into the deal and all of a sudden you have this set system in your mind and you've been doing all the same things and you just added this one little tool and then a couple of swings and all of a sudden your kids are starting to respond completely differently physically. And so Pablo became a, a, a mentor of mine and a great friend and he was at my wedding. I mean, he's, we, he, used to, he and his wife used to come up here and come to football games and spend weekends up here and Pablo was a massive influence on how I think, especially by kettlebell training um, and strength training, but kettlebells obviously in particular. Yeah. Um, and then um, I went to work at Appalachian State and I worked with a guy named Tommy Hoke, who was the head guy there. He hired me purely off of a recommendation made by Coach Kent. We had one phone call. He offered me the job over the phone. Never saw my face. 3,000 miles later, I'm his assistant there. And Tommy refined and helped me make amends with things I didn't understand with what material I had with Coach Kent. He was sort of like the polisher, you know what I mean? Mm. Spent six, seven months with him there and then got the full-time gig back here at Cal Poly. So I left Cal Poly to go to App State and then Cal Poly was like, ooh, we genuinely need a full-time person here. And then they brought me back. But that seven months with Tommy were really important for me to kind of answer any questions that I had with the Coach Kent material because he is a disciple of Coach Kent. We're part of the same coaching tree. Right. And uh, he polished things for me. He he gave me, you know, he gave me the vision that I needed in, in those cloudy areas that I had. And so Tommy's been, a, and he's a great friend. He's a dude that, I mean, Tommy Hugg's one of those dudes. Like, if you ever get a chance to have a beer with Tommy Hugg, jump on it because he's just the funnest guy ever and he's just the best. Yeah. Um, my, my Sifu, so my Qigong guy, uh, he's one of those people who will, I mean, if I had to, if I had to rank people, like this person's the most important and this guy's third, and right. Steve was right up there, and right, he's like holding hands with Coach Kent. Right. But it's a completely separate, different situation um, with uh, just the subject matter. But my Steve, he's my martial arts teacher, he's my spiritual mentor, guru, and then he's a Qigong master that I learned from. So he taught me everything I do with my Qigong stuff and helped us. This group of people who started this crazy journey, six years later, we pop out the back end and everybody's doctors and we're priests and we're doing all these things. And he's, 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 he was the, the almost the lone person who created this entire um, small community that we had. We started with 120 some people in this program and we finished with like 40. And that's who graduated with the doctor stuff. We actually finished with like 11 through the whole, um, the priest stuff and all that. I mean, it, it, it filtered down to the, to the very last few. And then I ended up falling out of that 11 to come here and take this job. And my my best friend in the world, Bob Joyce, he finished on that. That final crew was like six. Wow. So, I mean, it's who saw it the whole distance. It's, it's super small. But he's 
he transformed my life in ways I will never be able to express it, like, and make sense to anybody who'd be hearing it. It's just, it, it, there, no one comes into your life who touches you on all levels. Yeah. You know what I mean? And this is what this man did. And that's Dr. Jerry Allen Johnson, my Sifu. And the last person that I think I included on that, that list was, uh, Don Saladino. He owns Drive, Drive 495, I think is what it's called in, in, um, New York. And Don's a great friend. We met through the RKC, as most of my good friends, you included, are, are people that the RKC has just brought us together. Um, he came out to San Jose back in 09 or 10, maybe, and we fell in love at first sight type thing. And uh, we just had such a mutual sort of respect for one another and the, the sort of the way we think about fitness and how those to go. So we were immediate friends. And then we have periodically come back and forth. I go out to New York. He comes out to California. And it's like we've been lifelong friends, even though we only see each other maybe once a year. Yeah. Don is a s- absolute savage in the business world, fitness <laughs> business. Right. He understands how to put things together, how to coach, how to all those things, and make tons of money doing <laughs> yeah. it. Somebody that, if, if the business piece of it starts to become interesting to you, I will get you guys hooked up because Don is an animal. Yeah. Um, but listening to Don talk about business and listening to Don talk about just how he does things. He owns two of the most prolific um, money-making machines in New York. Um, he works with billionaires. He works with A-list celebrities. I mean, I, last time I was out there, I met Joaquin Phoenix and Jim Parsons and people, people like that yeah. who were just there on a Friday to get their lift in with Don, and I was teaching at RKC in the back of the building. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's those people. He he gets Ryan Reynolds ready for the Deadpool movies. He gets Blake Lively ready for all her movies. I mean, he's that guy. Yep. So he understands the the fitness side, the nutrition side. He does it all, and he's working with some of the heaviest hitters in Hollywood. Um, and like I said, when you just talk about Don, to Don, like we'll go to dinner. I'm like, all right, Don, talk to me about business. Talk to me about you know what are you looking for here? And it's just yeah. he's just wind him up and let him go. Wind him up and let him go, and just let him <laughs> just just sort of just vomit information at you. Yeah. And I hope this isn't going too long in my mentors. But no, it, it's it, all right. These guys need to I be think mentioned. I it's good to pay homage and to then, like the I people said, who you uh, feel like you're standing on the shoulders of. Completely. Yeah. And we're all kidding ourselves if we think that there aren't people who have laid the foundation. If you think that you're a self-made person, you're crazy. <laughs> the yeah. only person that I can honestly think of, and I'm sure we're going to cover this a little bit later, who actually has original thought is David Weck. And David's becoming a mentor of mine as we speak. Like, it's happening. David is a he. It's, it's scary to watch what he does, yeah. And the type of analysis that he does because he's a he's a balance expert and he's a he's even though I, I'm not sure what his degrees are in. I don't know but it, it's, yeah. he's a he's a biomechanist. I mean, he sees movement and he understands things. David's an incredible guy, and he's like I said, he's becoming a mentor because he just it's it's crazy to watch him work. Um, and he's, he's just got this incredible way of, of thinking outside of the box. But for the rest of us, there are people that, who are, who've been lifting us up the whole time and That's we right. never should lose sight of that. Yeah. Talking about, uh, winding him up and letting him go too. Right. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. He's a mad scientist. If you, if, we're going to make sure you guys get hooked up too. Yeah. I actually met him, um, okay. about a month ago. Okay. I happened to be at the same conference as him. Was the one uh, Helia was at? The one Helia was at. Yeah, I, yeah. I saw the picture Versa. of the two of them together. Yeah. Versa, yeah. Um, and I got a chance to do some work with them, maybe 30, 40 minutes, yeah. which is not not a lot for all the all the stuff that he can just, you know, spill out. But yeah. uh, but enough enough to have my, my eyes open to what he's doing. Yeah. Um, it's pretty it's pretty amazing stuff. And where I mean where Chris and I have been, you know, kind of his two confidants for the spinal engine piece and the whole like method stuff with the sprinting. Yeah. And we've been refining, refining, sharpening the blade for him because you know we, we understood the value in what he was doing, and we're we've adopted a lot of his ideas, and we're, we're we're trying to we're kind of beta testing all of it for him. And he's off to you know he's he's got seven or eight other ideas that he's working on yeah. as we're working on these old what are they, him the old ideas, but they're six months old. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, he's he's kind of the. Uh, the idea innovator piece and what's what's I was talking to Chris about is so neat that you guys have um, not only the technical understanding and the commitment to want to put this stuff into practice and and dive deeper into it, but also the opportunity to implement it with sure. hun- with hundreds of kids. Sure. Um, and you need both pieces. Which of is that. what which is what I think was David and I are good friends, but also what was so interesting for him 
when we started all this, is like he knows that I've got my, you know, Chris and I, we can touch 500 bodies. Right. And so we can get legitimate data right. on all this stuff just to, you know, um, overnight for him. Overnight. And it's, it'll, it'll take it, years. It's such valuable feedback. Sure. Um, and yeah, um, I would, I, I plan to talk to him for this podcast too. And I would Dude. love, I would love to go down to San Diego and see his awesome. laboratory. And one other day with him. Bro, we can make a phone call and make it happen for yeah. you. So just, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's well, he invited down. me down there. So, yeah. um, just whenever I Do make it. it happen. But, it. um, you know, since we're since we have kind of talked about the mentors and like all the all the roles they've played in your life, do you feel like you have a coaching philosophy? Um, and like what you're what you're really trying to accomplish with uh, with all the kids that you see? Well, again, it goes back to the relationships piece. Yeah. My first, my 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 primary philosophy, and this is why when you talk to Chris. So you just finished that podcast with Chris. What a great dude. Yeah. What a personable, likable, just thoughtful guy. I know. Sarah's the same way. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Um, I've surrounded myself with coaches who are people, who are people, people, and they are effective communicators. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's important to me because, again, we're going to ask a bunch of kids to do some things that are uncomfortable. They're going to make them get up early and get out of bed. They have to – There's there has to be an investment of some kind. And, oh, let's win a championship. That, that's that got – you know, it has, it has no substance to them. Of course, we're going to win championships. It's, it's, a, it's a foregone conclusion. What's going to get me up on Tuesday morning at 530? That's what I want to talk about. You know what I mean? Right. And a lot of the, the, the way we're working is we're trying to develop relationships with these athletes so – it's almost like you, they wouldn't want to let you down. You know what I'm saying? Right. Um, as far as a coaching philosophy goes, your coaching philosophy is going to be a, a, a adaptable because it's going to have to be given your your demographic and your situation. If I was the head strength coach at Alabama, for example, I'm going to get a completely different athlete than the one I'm going to get here at Cal Poly. Right. And what I mean by that is 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 on all levels. We're talking about their physicality, how big they are, how naturally fast they are, all of those things, how much development they're going to require to be competitive, um, all the way to their intellect. Okay? And not saying that Alabama kids aren't smart, but Cal Poly kids are very smart and all of them are. And so even our kids who are, you know, who, you know, maybe pulling up the rear as far as intellect goes, they're still smarter than most people you're going to come across on the street. That's right. And so my coaching philosophy is going to be geared around the fact that I have to develop these kids from, from the top down. They are going to be undersized coming in, so I'm going to have to build the athlete, which is great because that's why I'm so perfect for this job. Because I don't, I've been at a bigger school. I had a great time there. I had a seven, seven to eight year stint there. It was awesome. A lot of those kids showed up ready to play the day they showed up. Right. Most of the kids that come here have a year or two of development before we could consider putting them on the field. It's just the way it is. Because phys- physically, they're just not big enough to tolerate the demands of a Division One football game. Right. So my philosophy has always been, here, we have to win with speed because we're always going to be undersized. Just come watch us play the University of Montana, and you're like, it's, it's like the JV versus the varsity physically. Right. That we beat them every, you know, we've been the last two or three times we've played them. And it's because we have to be fast. So for me, speed, explosion, being powerful, being efficient, that type of stuff as far as athleticism goes, we work on that. This is not a powerlifting gym. You know, I, I, I can't tell you. I maybe have two kids on the football team that bench over 400 pounds. Um, I, I, I mean, I have a freak show that can squat nearly 700 pounds, so we won't talk about him. But <laughs> There's always outliers. Yeah, there's that one guy, and he's probably the only guy that can hit the 400 too. But our numbers are probably not going to blow anybody's skirt up. But us running by is going to. And that's what these teams end up seeing with us is like, holy crap, they're fast. Yeah. Our offense, we run the across trip. the Across the field, not just the typical speed players. Exactly. Our yeah. offense alignment can, can run. And it's – so my philosophy, I, I, I know I'm kind of just sort of reaching in blindly right now, would be where speed's going to be first. And not speed like track speed. We're talking about multidirectional, change of direction, right. explosion left and right. Adjust, accelerate, decelerate, that type of speed. And that's really, like, you're talking about more than speed. Like, that's really overall athleticism. 100%. Yeah. And we have to teach a lot of these kids how to be athletic. And I know that sounds really weird, but you'll, 
Not necessarily. Well, and if you watch the like the standards that we hold for our athletes and how they move, we have very specific things that we're looking for when they're doing certain things just because it's highly efficient way of moving. So example of like a 180 degree turn. What are they doing with their feet as they're decelerating? What are they doing with their head and eyes as they're turning? What are they doing with their arms and their spine when they're turning? What are they doing in terms of changing that direction where they're not wasting steps? Are they hinging open the gate and they have to put a foot down? They actually didn't travel anywhere yet they took a step. Like where are they wasting movement so that we don't run out of gas? Right. So we look at the way they move from we need to be hyper efficient and we need to be as explosive and powerful as we can be. And a lot of that has to do, it's less about genetics and it's more about like, do they understand body angles? Do they understand where their shins are in space when they're trying to do X, Y, and Z? Do they understand where their contact point on their feet foot is while they're trying to do whatever it is, sprint straight ahead, or if they're jogging, do they know those things? Fortunately, I mean, like I said, I'm at Cal Poly and I've got a bunch of really smart guys and gals. And so I can coach them on these like high nuance levels and they all can do it. And so my, my philosophy is we have to be fast. That's why the kettlebells make so much sense here because of the explosion and the, and the hip snap. And I mean, we've worked together so many of those certs that you know what I'm thinking about when we swing and it's high intensity stuff. It's, right. it's go as hard as you can and then put the bell down. In a football play, you go as hard as you can and then you huddle up. It's the same idea. Right. So philosophically, it's about speed. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, you alluded to doing some of the work with the bell, and I know that um, uh, you got involved in the RKC in the pretty early days. Yeah. Um, and, you know, stuck around through the split, but then also, even outside of um, the specific RKC world, just, just bringing the bell into a collegiate training place. And I'm sure it's been more widely adopted now than when you first started using it yeah. but even still it's not it's not as widely used as both you and I would probably assume sure. or 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 uh, would would like to see yeah um, but what was what was it like when you first started bringing that kind of stuff in because I know that in talking to you in the past some of some of what you guys deal with um, being a strength coach is butting heads with some of the um, Sport coaches? Sport coaches, <laughs> yeah. And especially when it comes to football, yeah. football strength training is not only super important, but it's also steeped in a lot of tradition. And it, it can it can be, depending on the right coach, the certain programs, that kind of stuff, pretty resistant to change. Yes. Um, and so like just, just, just what was it like trying to implement some of these newer, innovative, or just different um, things into, into some of the programs you worked with? The, the good news for your question is that football coaches on the coaching sort of spectrum are the most pliable. They're the most willing to bend. Okay. So, and what I mean by it's that like is if it works, then talk to a baseball coach, talk to a basketball coach, talk to a soccer coach, and you'll come back going, holy crap, you want to talk about rigid. Hmm. Okay. It's those cultures. I, uh, I don't know what I wrote it for, which publication... But I had a soccer coach <clears throat> tell me, this is years ago, here at Cal Poly, um, trying to push the weights piece with them. I was like, you know, listen, I can really help your team and injury prevention, blah, 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 blah. His answer to me was, um, Pele didn't lift weights, so why should we? Who? Pele. Pele, yeah. It's like Michael Jordan doesn't do X, Y, and Z, so right. yeah. it's like, well, you haven't recruited any Pele's, let alone, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If we had a team full of Pele's, then you're exactly right. Yeah. Fortunately, you've got a bunch of these kids who are slow and injury prone and all this other stuff. So, bringing the kettlebells in for me was actually pretty easy to do. Um, I am much more immersed in the variety of kettlebell training right now. What I mean by that is back in the old days when like Chris White was playing for me, it was swings and snatches. Right. So, it was like, let's lift, let's do our normal lift, let's stay within the system, let's do our Olympic lifting, let's lift super heavy, let's back squat heavy, blah, 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 and then we're going to finish them with kettlebells. Right. And that's how we did it back in the old days. Now, I'm to the point where I'm flirting with the idea with my basketball teams of going exclusively kettlebells and some of the WEC method stuff. Yeah. And so, we have gone that far to a point where we're going to abandon barbells and get away from dumbbells and we're going to, get, and we're going to go that far that distance. Yeah. When I was at San Jose State, I had a assistant coach who who liked to push me a little bit more. 
Uh, it, 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 was, it was good and bad, but it was good in the sense that he made, he forced me to, um, he never really backed me into a corner, but it was that kind of plays that he would make. And I said, well, you know, screw this. And I spent two years doing nothing but kettlebell training with one of the soccer teams. And we won championships every year, at least uh, um, regular season championships, league championships. Right. So we proved that not only could I get a team ready, in complementary to our running program, but I could get the team ready physically with just kettlebells alone, but we also went up to do it at a high level. And so um, bringing the bells in for me back then, I had a head coach here who was, uh, he was very heavy-handed in terms of how he wanted things done, but he was also understood the athletes, that rapport piece that I've been talking about, the whole relation piece. Um, they loved us here. They loved me. And he, one of the funnier quotes, if you knew this, this gentleman, uh, got a kind of a heavier, kind of military type attitude and background. And he's like, you know, he's always kind of just yank my chain and, you know, break my balls, I guess is what it be. He's like, you know, if I ever run for politics, you're going to be my campaign manager because all these kids are drinking the Kool Aid. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things. And right. it's because of, it goes back to, I, we could be jumping rope and hula hooping in here. And we could convince them that it would be useful. It's just about the relationships, but I'll stop beating that horse. Um, but when we brought the kettlebells and he saw an immediate change too, because we, we went from being a kind of middle of the road program to all of a sudden being playoff eligible and winning nine football games in an 11 game season. He knew what we were doing was, it was, it was working and it was working for these kids. So as far as football, I've, since my kettlebell stuff, I've only had one coach who, who pushed and pulled. I won't say his name. You know, he's one yeah, of those guys. Matter. But um, my football coaches have been kind of great about it. And they know, they see my passion. Right. And with with, uh, with a strength coach, especially for a football program, they're going to want passion. They're going to want somebody who believes in what they're doing and like really wants to do right by their team. Right. And, and you travel with the I travel with football. football team too, yeah. right? Yeah. So you're, you're heavily involved in everything I'm, those guys are yeah. doing. Talk about relationship wise. Exactly. And, and like I have to miss, like we're in spring ball right now and we, we practice early in the morning. Well, early in the morning here is our hot time for other teams. So I'm missing a lot of spring practices and it's killing me because I know that there's an expectation those kids have just to see me out there, you know, walking around and stuff. And I'm not giving that to them. But um, yeah, it's the kettlebells have been amazing for us. If, yeah. if I, <laughs> I, I'm glad that the kettlebells haven't really become mainstream because I have the advantage all the time. Feels like a secret weapon. Yeah, rumor you did completely. Yeah. yeah. And I've got, you know, how how long has it been now? Where it's two thousand seventeen, so close to almost fifteen years in, in the RKC and using the system. I've been doing it for a long time now and I know how to like plug it in here and there and all that stuff. So even if it did catch fire, it's fine because I know I'm fifteen years ahead of everybody. So right. we're good. Yeah. And it's uh it's funny too, I mean like there's so much uh People that are within the RKC, it's like we're, you know, we're like a couple of kettlebell guys, like sitting here glorifying the kettlebell. Sure. And, uh, you know, I tell people all the time, like, I am a kettlebell guy. Like, I would describe myself like that. Like, I take it as a compliment. Um, but I didn't, I didn't just choose to be in love with a tool. Right. It's, I, I, I fell in love with everything that could be done with it and all the results that I saw yep. in, in all sorts of applications, be it like athletes. I have some youth athletes that I work with all the way down to like gen pop people. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that it wasn't the beginning of things for me, but eventually you just, you just came to understand what it could, what it could bring to any, any type of a program. So you just fall in love with the effects that it has. Absolutely. And it's, um, it's this, it's this love, this kind of built on built on results and then now on top of that uh some of my favorite people in the world are from within the rkc sure um and it's and it's not because of a shared love for the kettlebell it's because of just a shared love of committing to something that they know works and they're some of my favorite thinkers um in in the world you know so it's uh it's it's all it's all results driven driven. 100 percent. yeah um there's nothing that i in the bodybuilding world especially, because that's where I kind of got my start. I fell in love with bodybuilders. Like I said, the whole magazine and as a nine-year-old thing. But that's a t- that, it takes so much time. Like you, it's a, well, so much work over four or five months to actually see a real effect. And you're probably going to have to be taking pictures so that you can actually see it because you look at yourself all the time. <laughs> kettlebell stuff. You start kettlebell swinging, it bleeds into everything that you do. And within a week or so, you're going to go, holy cow, I feel a total difference. Yeah, I feel a difference in how I'm moving. I feel a difference in how I like... 
like my cardio, like everything yeah. just upgraded. Even just posturally. Yeah, it's crazy. How you hold yourself. Yeah, everything. It's I got, I got like half an inch taller when I started really kettlebells. Yeah, awesome. it's, just, it's just like you just are stronger and more upright. Yeah, you know, just all that upper back stuff. Let's uh, let's get into some of the qigong stuff. Okay. I guess first of all, like, how did you how did you find that practice? Like, was it a personal practice first, or like, how did this at the beginning? How did it come into your life? I'll try to keep this brief, and yeah. I'm not sure that I can do it or not. <laughs> um, my first experience with qigong was with John Duquesne on that RKC weekend oh, for the very first time. That's right. I forget that he's a qigong master as well. Yeah, he's a qigong guy, a hardcore qigong guy. Yeah. Um, and we did a recharge. It was a Sunday morning. I was dead, and God bless John Duquesne. And of course, I love my qigong, but I it was I, I was so physically out of it and so drained that it missed me completely. Like, it was just, okay, I'm just glad I'm not swinging a kettlebell right now. Right. Um, it is one of those practices that you get out of it what you put 100%. in and with the intention that you bring to it. Absolutely. So if you're not able to bring that intention, then it's it's not going to be something that is going to have just this inherent benefit. It almost looks just like... Just by going through the motions. Yeah, it, it just almost looks like stationary dance. Right. I mean, it's it's very it's very dancey the way it looks. For anybody who's listening and doesn't understand what we're talking about, it's... Think of tight like a Tai Chi class, and right. Qigong looks and feels very similar to that. Sort of a moving meditation, yeah, exactly. flow practice. Right. Um, uh, and that one, like I said, it was like 2003, 2004. Um, took the job at San Jose State in 2006. It was 2008 when some personal training clients who happened to be yogis um, that I was working with was like, hey, you know, listen, there's a... There's this guy, he's coming out of retirement, he's based out of Monterey, he's this really legendary Kung Fu guy who's teaching this doctoral class in, in medical Qigong. We think you should consider doing this because at the time I was finishing my Z Health stuff up, I had all the kettlebell stuff. I was kind of, you know, I had this kind of eclectic practice that was working, we were mixing all these different elements and it was, it was all seamlessly happening. And they were like, you know, this would be great for you career-wise. First of all, you get to put doctor before your name, <laughs> which at that time was really important to me. Yeah, and, um, that's true. I've always known you as Dr. Holder. <laughs> it kills me, dude, because... Chris first, but Dr. Holder... The, uh, the second you get those lead initials, it, it, it ceases to be important to you. Yeah. <laughs> I fought tooth and nail to get those and complete my degree and do all that stuff. And the minute I was handed my diploma, I was like, it's not what I expected yeah. it to be, and it's it like, doesn't matter. Just call me Chris. Right. <laughs> so they pushed and pushed and pushed. And I've got a, a, a much longer story, but let's just say that I... I Went back and forth quite a bit, got my wife on board a little bit, and then the very last minute, as they were closing the, the class, because it was a, it was like again, it was this long four year commitment for the, the three or four year commitment for the qigong, and then the other piece sort of became a thing. Um, he was getting ready to close the class, like it was like this is it's a six week grace period, and like once you pass that time, you've gone too far, you've missed too much material. There's it's almost next to impossible to catch up. So you out. could go to the first six weeks. For and six and weeks. use that as the time to figure out whether you wanted to commit to the whole program. Correct. Okay. And once that six weeks time lapsed, no newbies could come through. Mm. Because, again, you, they had, you'd gone too far down the rabbit hole now. Right. And at the very last minute, the last day, it was a Saturday. I'll never forget it. I had gone, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. We're going to go ahead and just, we're going to go and taste it, see what it's about. Um, I told them after a training session for they were leaving to go out to Monterey to go to class that day. It's like, I'm not going to do this. I can't. I just can't justify the time. The money's too much. It's just like, I can't do this. And they're like, okay, that's it. And then drove away. And Justin, as, as, as sure as I'm sitting here looking at your face, when they drove off, I could feel doom roll into my life. It was like, I have just made the most galactic bad decision. And I knew it. I literally could feel the clouds rolling. And so they had gone off to class. We had another training session that following Tuesday. And when he came in, he, the guy was Dr. Cook and, and, a, and a guy named Barbara. Um, I was like, you guys, I think I made a mistake. Because it just all I, did is I thought about the rest of the weekend and going into the next day. And, and mind you, Justin, I, at the time, I didn't really know what it was. It was one of these things where I was, uh, again, I had that experience with John on the field in Minnesota. But it was like I, there was just something calling me. It was like I was being pulled. And I can't, you know, I know what it is now, but at the time I was like, I don't understand why I'm so interested. And it had nothing to do with the initials. It was, there was something more, you know, divine that was dragging me in that direction. So they came in for the training session that Tuesday, and I was like, listen, I made a mistake. I know they closed the course. Is there any way that they could make an exception? He would be willing to make an exception, and I'll show up on Thursday. It was Saturday, Thursday was, was our all day thing. 
and a phone call was made. Some some groveling and begging was done, and I was given permission to start, given that those two individuals were willing to catch me up. And I drove up on that Thursday, sat outside this building. There's some people playing hacky sack, like some hippie guys. I was like, oh, what the hell have I gotten myself into? Again, and not knowing anything other than those two people that I was going to, you know, I, I've been doing their training for them, and they were going to the courses themselves. I had, I had no expectation. I didn't know what was going to come. And I decided in the, 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 the parking lot that day, I was like, okay, first off, I don't know what I'm doing, but whatever this guy's going to say, I'm just going to accept it as truth. Knowing that I was going to be giving some information that was going to be very unorthodox or very outside of my stream of consciousness. But when you when you put yourself in those situations, you have to you have to commit a hundred percent. You have if you're to gonna, if you're going to go through it. And if you if you if you were there and heard what we heard and experienced what we were experiencing, it's really easy to pass the information through your already filters mm-hmm. that aren't equipped to uh, filter it. You know what I mean? It's yeah, I, I don't have any sort of experience with this so how do I have any opinion on it right so anyways I go up to class that night I remember walking in the door I'll never forget I walked in the door and there was such an incredible sense of being at home um, and again I'm in a room full of people that I don't know most of which are I'm the big sports guy and everybody there was you know they're drinking kombucha drinks and you know they would it was that group it was this kind of the Santa Cruz hippie thing um, and I was home I knew I was home and it took me maybe an hour that night to go oh, this is where I'm supposed to be it was, it was, it's a it was a beautiful time when you're experiencing something big and it's and, you, and you're and you're well aware that it's happening and you get to sort of like kind of smirk to yourself like I'm in in real time knowing that this is going to be gigantic you know what I mean yeah um, instead of like looking back on something like that was big and I didn't know it then yeah those moments are having having the awareness in the relationship with yourself to to be able to see those moments right and and the openness to dive in. Um, and just and just and just decide that I know I'm going to hear some stuff that is that is completely outside of anything in my experience. Sure. And just to just to give it the opportunity um, to come in is pretty pretty rare right. in this world. And like that, I think that in itself um, speaks volumes of of just like you as as a human, even 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 at the beginning of this whole journey well i appreciate the compliment but <laughs> let me let me let me spin it this way for you then and as your listeners um there's a lot of esoteric stuff that that's that's woven throughout my experience there but if i told you justin i can take you to dagobah and we can train with yoda <laughs> and all of it's real yeah there's a part of you, there's a piece of you like, hell yeah, let's hell do yeah, this. Yeah. And that's what my experience was. Yeah. My, my Sifu is one of the most incredible human beings I've ever met because he's a beautiful man and he's an incredible martial artist. I mean, nobody in the world moves like this man. But the things that he can do and the things that he taught us that we can do now, the only way to explain it, the only parallel to it is something out of a Star Wars film. So it didn't take much, <laughs> much nudging on anyone's part once I was there to go holy crap yeah. this is I'm living every 12 year old boy's dream right now as a 30 something year old man I'm training and we're doing these things right. and I like you know I could tell you some crazy stories of the things that I've seen with my own eyes and there is no explanation for it I mean there's there's no however conditioned your mind is or whatever you no physical explanation for it yeah, it defies all the laws of gravity and physics and, and bio, you know, the biochemistry. And it's just, it's nuts. I've seen healings that have happened literally by the snaps of fingers. People who are like on their deathbed just get up and it's, they're good to go. And there's no explanation for it other than it's something miraculous and something that's being harnessed and it's magical, literally. And so, um, I, again, I appreciate the compliment of being sort of open to the ideas of things. But when you have something as absolutely tantalizing is what was put in front of me. It was pretty easy to stick around. Yeah, that's true. I uh, there's there's a quote that I wish I could remember who it who it came from, and it's just that when real teachers enter your life, just learn from them. It doesn't yeah. matter what what they what what specifics they're teaching. Sure. When a real teacher enters your life, you just let go and just learn from them. Just let it happen. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what what field it is. Like there's. People that are that are on that level in in anything have so much to offer you. Yeah, um, that you just you you just have to get out of the way. And, um, and, 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 and a perfect sort of parallel to that is I watched a lot of my classmates allow nonsense to get in the way of their experience, and they ended up leaving the course before they completed it or they left too early, 
and it was like you let some political or some rumor or something about whatever it was we were doing get in the way of you having this amazing time and so just let the teacher teach and if he says something that sort of rubs you the wrong way it's not an indictment on him. It's it's it's, it's listen. We don't, we we don't agree. It's like the whole thing with our political situation that's going on right now. Yeah. Listen, just relax, everybody. Yeah. Wh- whoever won that election, just relax. Yeah. I, I'm very fixed into my side, and I believe that my person is the right one, and all that other stuff. But hell or high water, it's just it's, it's all going to be okay. You know what I'm saying? And these people, like I said, sort of piggybacking off your statement, they let. Their own BS get in the way of having some just absolutely beautiful experience. Yeah. Let the teacher teach. I love it. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, I mean, there's so many parallels to um, a fitness journey, but also just life where it's bringing, bringing some of your, your own shit into and, and letting it get into the way of, of things that are trying to enter your life or right. things that are lessons that are, that are trying to be taught to you. Right. Um, we all know, like going into a like a romantic relationship, if you bring your luggage from the old relationships in, you don't have a chance. No. We all know that. It's the same thing with all these other experiences. Like, yeah. if you're going to go off to a workshop with David Weck, if you when you plan that trip and you go there, and of course he's going to say things to you like, "What? Yeah, just <laughs> listen. Yeah, just listen to just what. Get he's, out of the way. He could be wrong. Yeah. And you know what? I'm sure there's been times with David that he's been wrong. He's just missed the mark. Yeah, but. Uh, let it happen. Let it let it be what it is, and don't force your own BS onto it to like flavor it or to screen it by any way. That's right. Because you're gonna you're gonna miss something. Yeah, you have to set down set down all the stuff that you're carrying to be able to pick up new yeah, things. No you doubt know, about it. It's um, yeah. So I guess we can fast forward. Like we don't have to go into the details of you know the four years in the program. Sure. We're, we're leaving a bit early. You said to come and take this job. Yeah. Um, but. You know, I spoke to I spoke to Chris White about his um, his master's thesis, yes. which is was that something that was involved in the finishing of your program also? No. Was okay. So those are separate. Correct. Okay. So your your doctoral research research was an entirely different separate. Study. Okay. Yes. So let's like what um, it was similar in bringing qigong to competitive athletes. Correct. Um, and where where did that happen? What were the details of that study and Kind of what you guys were, were trying to accomplish when you were designing the practice, okay, and introducing them. Just I mean the whole background. Okay, so the so we have to go back a little bit. Okay. So my doctoral stuff is in in, is in um, uh, oncology. So right. I'm a cancer specialist. And as we were going through the whole cancer piece of things, which was our entire last year at school, so it was just immersion in cancer, which is it's uh, it was a pretty incredible experience. That part of it on top of what's already I'd already experienced just because you look at cancer and you look at some of these really sort of insidious diseases in a very different light. doesn't necessarily make them any less scary because of the potential, but you don't look at them with the same sort of like vampire devil eyes that people think of when they hear cancer. Um, like I said, my when it was first presented to me to start this program, he was coming out of retirement. The reason he came out of retirement because his daughter wanted to go through the program. So he had taught it a couple times, and that was it. He was retiring. He wanted to just go be, just go do what an old Kung Fu master does. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, okay, I'll do this one last time for you. So we knew at the end of the program, this was literally the last time it was going to be taught. And because of the attrition rate, and he was so pleased with those of us that stuck it through and saw the transformations that we had had, um, he gave us the... Uh, his gift or his graduation gift was to do our doctoral research on anything we wanted. Wow. So instead of having to do clinical trials with cancer people and working in hospitals and all that stuff, we could create our own study and do exactly what we wanted to do and test what we wanted so to test. So he was an oncology specialist as He's well. He's oncology. So that's guy. what this program was. Yes. Okay. Well, you spend the first several years learning the basics. So it's like, think of like a general practitioner level stuff. Right. And then it focuses. And then it becomes more harnessed into, you need all the background to understand the, the back end. Right. And we went through, you know, like the, the whole psychology series. We went to gerontology. We went through gynecology. We went through, like, you know, all the youth stuff. I mean, we went through major phases to understand those things. And then you just finished and focused on the cancer. But you needed all those pieces prior to, to understand sort of the mechanism of cancer and how to work with it. Um, or work against it, I guess, would be the better way of saying it. 
So my study for my doctoral research, I wanted to, my, my, my whole thing was, okay, if I can take a cancer person, someone who's a stage four cancer, who's basically given, been given their death sentence, and we have techniques and tools to help them get well. Um, and we know that with Qigong type stuff, and if you read any, this and this is all over the world, you can just go into a Google search and uh, uh, your web med type stuff and, and look up Qigong and cancer. And all of these studies will come up that they've done in China and all these other places. And one of the biggest things was Qigong brings inflammation markers down. Right. And we know with cancer and all those things, and, and, and even someone who's who's got the most lay understanding in inflammation and all that stuff is a bad deal um, for people suffering ca- the cancer and all that stuff. And my thinking was, well, if, if Qigong is going to help cancer patients and it's going to do all these things and all these miracle healings, and one of the main features is, is it brings inflammation down. Well, what would that do for a competitive athlete? And at the time, I was up in the Bay Area. We were down the street from where, you know, uh, Aramis and where CrossFit was getting their big thing. And with with the CrossFit world, the big concern, at least in my mind as a strength professional, is a lot of these people are getting hurt. They get the, the blame goes to the coaching, and some of that's true, but a lot of it is because people are not managing their inflammation correctly. Right. And the wheels come off because they've gotten in the red and they can't get out of the red now. And they continue to train at such an incredible clip that something's got to give. Right. And typically it's, you know, a tendon, a muscle, something happens. Yep. And they've tried to solve it with nutrition, which definitely helps, and all these recovery methods, which definitely helps. But my thinking was, well, if I can take an athlete who's healthy, good blood work done, do all that type of stuff, and on paper they're healthy people, they're not, they're not suffering from an illness, yet they're pushing their bodies in such high levels, if I can get their inflammation down right. and I can manipulate a couple other variables, can I actually impact performance? Right. And so I sat down and I created a kind of a list of these arbitrary things that I thought were important to performance. And it didn't have anything to do with skill or anything like that. It was your ability to focus, your ability to shut the monkey mind down, your ability to sleep the night before the event, your ability to do all these various little things that you don't really think about. Right. Until it's already impacted you. Right. It's the everything else piece. Exactly. To any athlete. So we put the study together. It was all based off of surveys. So that's, you know, it, it, it loosens a little bit of the, the rigidity of, of the, 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 the study. And we took um, three in-season teams, four in-season teams, and we had control groups, and then we had groups that were getting one-on-one medical Qigong treatments for either myself or other doctors I brought in to have them be treated. <laughs> Twice a week they would get this. And at the end of every competition, they filled out the exact same um, survey. It was one of these seven or eight questions, rank one to ten, one being horrible, ten being optimal. How did you feel in this category, that kind of thing? And it was very specific questions to sort of get a reading on, on what they were doing. And and then, we, and then I, as I said, the, the, the people who were in, in, in the um, control group were just, they weren't getting the Qigong intervention. Right, but they and were still they being were still, monitored for all these. They were still these. filling out their sheets. Right. So, Brian's series, they have a binder that's like this big, <laughs> full hundreds and hundreds of sheets yeah. of all the stuff. And then what we did is we crunched numbers and threw it through statistical analysis. And what we were able to just determine was um, that regular medical Qigong treatments actually enhanced performance based off of the variables that we were looking at. And one of the craziest things we, that we, we found, and this was the inspiration for Chris's research, which we also found in his research once we came out the back end of his stuff, was that the people who were taking the Qigong intervention, when you were grading, like, you know, how how was my sleep the night before the game, the competition, you would get this consistent, every time repeatable product. Was it a 10 every time? No, it was typically we've hovered between 7 and 8 or 8 and 9. But what you what you saw was every week it was the same numbers over and over again, over and over again. They were repeating the same numbers over and over again. And what you were getting with the other group, we would get tens in the other group. I remember going through the numbers, like, damn it, there's another ten. Shit, right. they're gonna throw but my, get my some numbers fours off. And fives. But you get the fours and fives. Right. So we would see these radical swings back and forth. And with the Chico group, they all leveled off and they just stayed. And so what we were getting was consistency. With athletes, consistency is gigantic. And balance. Balance. Yeah, it's it's so important. And so. When I finished that research, I turned my stuff in. It was great. And when Chris came on to the staff here, 
he and I started doing some Qigong stuff with him for some of the stuff he wanted to sort of address with his strength and all that. Right. And he saw an instant result also. So I was like, hey, bro, when you're getting done with your stuff, if you want to do research, I'll back your research. I'll, I'll help you write it all. I'll help you do it all. I want to just do a legit Qigong thing. And so I don't know how much you want to get into this for, for this, this podcast, but we looked at the impact of a regular Qigong exposure to strength athletes and can we actually enhance strength gains over a short period of time. Yeah, and we don't have to go too much into the findings. Chris and I talked pretty much at length about it. So if, yeah. you, if you haven't listened to that podcast, go back and check out Chris's because we go pretty deep into it. But it's... Uh, yeah, it's it's we pretty were, remarkable. We were thrilled with the outcome. Yeah, thrilled. Yeah, pretty some some pretty remarkable numbers and gains that, especially given that these subjects were highly trained athletes yep. at the beginning of it, yep. the type of change that you can see physically in eight weeks is nearly unheard of. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious about your doctoral study. Um, you said they were getting um, a weekly. Twice a week. Twice a week, um, one-on-one Correct. Qigong practice. Was that um, something that was designed for them? And yes. it was Okay, so it wasn't, yes. like in Chris's study, it was a standard practice. Well, it was a standard practice that we, we manipulated. So let me, give you, let me give you two versions. For Chris's, yes. for Chris's study, we took something called the Taoist 5 yin organ exercise. Um, I guess you would call it set. Right. But we, we did some spinning on it, and we changed some things around, and we altered it to some things that I wanted to work on, given my understanding of the way bioenergetics works and the few things I know with athletes. Like, they need a lot of this, and they don't need so much of that. Right. You play with the knobs. We turn them, some things up, turn some things down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that practice was done in a very much a class-type setting where I would get in front of the group, and I would lead them through the entire practice. You've experienced that practice yourself. I have a couple but times. But for, for your listeners, it's it's a... Think of, like I said, like a Tai Chi class, and there's the person up front leading the motions, and everybody is just sort of uh, following along, and we're talking and telling them about you know what to think about and all that good stuff. For the doctoral research, because this is medical Qigong, so if you came to me with, you know, I've got X, Y, or Z, um, and you're coming like as a paying client to me, that's a very different practice where you're laying on the table with your eyes closed with, with like meditation music playing, and I'm manipulating your energy for you. Mm. So you're, with Chris's study, they did it for themselves with right. a little bit of my help. For my study, it was they laid on a table and I did the work for them. Okay. Which makes that actually even more profound for the whole Qigong argument. Right. Because they did nothing other than lay on a table with their eyes closed. Right. So that's the difference between the two. And given the fact that they were working with people who were immersed in that world, when you and I say we were to do a, uh, like the Qigong practice for Chris's study, that's kind of a 24 hour thing. It kind of lasts that long. And then it just sort of fizzles out because life takes over. When I work on you, it's more like 72 hours to even further out. So they were getting these full dose, like heavy treatments from people who were very skilled and very um, sort of tuned with the whole, the whole way energetics work. And they were getting it from these people who are now master level people. Um, and that's why that, again, to me, that original research is so compelling also is because it's, it's so fundamental on how medical Qigong works and the results across the board, like part of my, if you ever read that research, the very end, like the actual stuff that I handed in, you will see testimonials from everybody. So they, everybody who participated in the um, experimental group wrote full testimonials on their experience. Mm-hmm. And it's some of the most amazing things you'll ever hear. I mean, and the fact that we were impacting young minds like that. It was one of the most thrilling things I've ever done because I was giving something that's so fundamental to who I am and something that I love so much. And we're taking 21, 22 year olds who are getting ready to start life, like truly start on their own and, and sort of helping them change their worldview and getting them outside of the box that we're living here um, because there's something, the potential of something else. And it was great. And you read it in their words. Yeah. So, um, Adam, did I answer your question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even remember what the question right. was, but I, I like everything that happened Good. in the last uh, few minutes. We've, we've had a lot of pot. Well, everything we've done with the Qigong has been amazing. Yeah. It's been amazing. Right now I'm working with one of my athletes who has type 2 diabetes. Her pancreas is shot, and she wears a um, 
she's got these two portal ports that she had, one's one's on the like above her belly, like in the pancreas itself, and one's on her arm. And she's got a an app that her doctors have given her that monitors her blood sugar around the clock. So all she has to do is turn her phone on, she can get a number. And I'm doing one on ones with her right now. This is not to toot my own horn. This is just to let your listeners know the power of this. We have done three treatments with her, and her pancreas is kicked back on. And she's her numbers are, are like she's they're plummeting to back to normal states. Right. And she hasn't had this in back to like what they would consider like pre diabetic correct kind of levels. And this yeah. is a young lady who, which for for the most part, that's once you've kind of crossed a certain line, it's kind of the accepted belief that things don't go the other way. Sure. Once you've which, crossed which, into like what they consider quote like full on yep. full blown diabetes, it yep. doesn't really go the other way. Right. And, and, and I, the, the the way her diabetes works, and we've spoken to all her medical people about this. This her problems are going to be one of these things where this is forever now. And they tell them this. It's we call it clinical hexing in the Qigong world. It's like, listen, I'm you're going to die, right. and then all these people just they basically crawl in their hole and go die. Right. You are this now. Yes. Yeah. And they, they've assigned some sort of title to them, and now they are going to live that out. And the cool thing with her, because, of course, with what I do, I mean, if anybody saw me work on her, um, I stand around her for about eight minutes waving my hands, and then I touch her thumbs. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You, you, you're smiling right yeah. now for the yeah. listeners. Well, I love that you can have um, such a, like, this is such a big part of your life and such a, such a, life affirming thing that you do but I love that you can have like the candid ability to kind of like break it down like this and like you know like it's such a special part of what you do but then to be able to describe it as like look I stand around and I wave my hands and yes. you know like it's I think that's that's such a cool juxtaposition to the to the to the average person that's what it looks like right but what we're getting is we're getting real time data on this girl that we you know 10 years ago we couldn't have never gotten and it's super cool because right. I'm you know I'm you could actually look at times. Like I was like, okay, I want, to, I want you to look at 8.45 and then we're going to look at these other times and she's looking at all this stuff and then she came in the next day and she's like, hold on, my, my numbers are down further than they've ever been. Yeah. And Since it, I started wandering. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's just amazing that that there's these other things out there. So you people who are listening to this, like listen to me, the, the Western medicine is fantastic and they're doing their best but there's other things and, and, and don't be afraid to, to, to venture out and, and try other things in conjunction with your mes- your Western uh, modality that you're you're sticking with or what have you. Yeah. Um, there there are, there are ways to heal that you don't even understand, and you just need to go look for them. Yeah. Well, I I think one of the biggest things that, and I'm sure that you know this audience will understand it. It's mostly people that are either coaches or people that are that are interested in their fitness journey. And one of the one of the first things that you really realize when you start paying close attention to um, any fitness journey is that your body's amazing. Yeah, and it's it's capable of so much more than we know, dude. Even in the Western medical world, and it's so amazing at healing itself. And if you can if you can get out of the way and let some of that stuff happen, or do things to activate some of its natural sure. healing capabilities, right? Which I'm sure is a lot of what you feel like you're doing. It's not necessarily strictly just the practice is doing something. It's activating. It's activating things within the body that are that are like taking it even further. Right. Um, and like we we talked about before we started recording. Yeah. The way that we cheat when people look at the body, it's the physical body, and then there's an the emotional body. Literal bodies. Now we're talking about like think of holograms. Right. And then the spirit body. There's three pieces to Justin that's sitting in front of me right now. Not just the physical piece that I can put my hands on. Right. And, and not even of, in an abstract way. It is, a, it is a concrete, there are three selves. And, and it are, depends on what system you're looking at, but that's the system that I work in. Right. But you, you can you can go see studies where they've been able to capture, you know, with thermo this and, you know, all these types of sophisticated ways of, of sort of establishing what they're seeing. Um, what people don't understand is those three pieces as far as the way we look at stuff. A lot of people are sick and it has nothing to do with the physical body. There's something, there's a spiritual crisis going on or... And something your listeners may have a little bit better time grasping is there's a mental thing going on, and it's just making the physical body sick. Yeah, and we're seeing an epidemic, epidemic. right now of, it's crazy. of just mental health, whatever yeah. you want to call it. And again, there's no, not really, I mean, you can look at some hormonal stuff, but there's not really any biomarkers per se sure. of, of um, kind of a, a widespread sickness. When, um, and if you take take that even a step further, how many people you know 
who are dealing with some illness or they're dealing with something and their doctors are telling them, we don't know what this is or we've never seen it like this before or we're not sure how this is happening. This is just the end result. Right. And, you know, it's like, well, we don't, you know, we don't know how you got here. They'll immediately, they're knee jerk. Well, your diet sucks or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, that's easy. That's, that's, right. that's the cheap out. Or there's something else going on. Cause I've got tons of people that I see. I have a private practice here in, in town that I, that it's very low key. I don't advertise or do anything. These people just kind of find me. And more often than not, they're having some sort of physical thing that's going on and it has nothing to do with their physical body. And once you get them realigned from a spiritual or, 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 or we call it emotional, so the thing mental and emotional is all the same, sort of like cut from the same piece of wood. Um, once those things get a little more balanced out, the physical body then gets relief. Right. And so, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who have been in spiritual crisis. And you can think about that however you'd like. Right. Um, all the way up to like exorcism level bad things. And their physical body is suffering because something spiritual is happening to them. And as long as if you can counsel them and then do the energetic sort of solve things for them, the physical body just gets, gets the break. Yeah. I know with my own personal things, challenges that I've had physically, the second that I got dialed really stiff back into my practice, things cleared up. Yeah. And it was because something was goofy out and then the kind of the ethers more than it was physically what was going on with me. Yeah. And I'm sure that you see all sorts of um, positive side effects in the people that you treat. Oh, yeah. Um, that are areas that they didn't even necessarily know were lacking sure. until 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 they saw relief or improvement. Right. Um, yeah, man. That um, I think that's a perfect a perfect place to kind of move into some of these these closing things. Okay. And um, I'm curious what the either. Either in some of the people that you treat or or the athletes that you work with, what's the what's one of the biggest things that you see that really holds people back in 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 moving towards where where they want to be? And you can interpret that in any in any sense in any of these three bodies that okay. we're yeah. talking about. So here you go, you're awesome, bro. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people don't know how to express themselves. They've been told how to express themselves, whether it be culturally, where they live the religion that they're kind of tied to a lot of the people that come in that I see don't feel like they have the license to just be themselves mm. you know what I'm saying and so there's a part of their soul that's being stifled because they're not actually being genuine they're being authentic you know what I'm saying and so with a lot of the healings I see especially clinical side it's about them getting more in touch with who they are and not so much the roles or the, 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 the different masks that they're wearing. You know, who, who is Justin Lin? Yeah. He's, you know, he's this guy and he's this guy. No, who, I want to know who, who you are. Who were you before you were you? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That level stuff. That kind of organic, like your soul level piece. Because a lot of us and myself, I'm just as much to blame for any of this stuff as anybody else. You know, who's Chris Holder? Well, he's the coach and he's a dad. And, you know, no, that's bullshit. That's, that's that, that, that's sort of the roles that I've taken on. That's not who I am. And once you can get those people starting to get into this, this real talk with themselves and kind of be truthful with what's going on in their world and, be, and kind of come to terms with that, a lot of those healings just happen automatically because they get in touch with who who they were before they were the, who they are now. You know what I mean? Um, with the athletes, again, for me... One of the greatest gifts, and this kind of goes back to maybe one of the earlier questions, but it, it just, we're framing it around the whole Qigong thing. I love that we're exposing them to something that's fantastic. And I don't mean that like, oh, you're fantastic, meaning like they can't explain to you what they're experiencing. They're having a very real, very palpable, very like um, they can put their fingers and taste it experience from somebody just standing around waving his hands and touching their thumbs. You know what I mean? Right. And they know something's changing. They can feel it happening. I'm, I feel good about the idea that I'm giving them exposure to something so that when they go off and they go start their families and they start becoming, you know, these contributing citizens to our world, that they're not going out there and they're stuck in a box that we've all put them in. They've had experiences. They've had their own experiences that have been genuine and real and um, kind of life changing a little bit on, on some level or another where they're going to thrive in different ways because they're going to be critical thinkers and they're not going to let the 
they're not going to let what they're seeing on Facebook influence what you know how they're going to think about things and it's uh, it's it's a, it's a pretty wonderful thing to know you're going to be able to touch someone's life that easily and and do it in a way where they have okay you've had the experience now the only way to get away from this experience now is to lie to yourself you know what I mean right. so uh, again I don't know if I've answered your question at no, all but no no it's beautiful man I, I think that's that's the number one uh, opportunity or um I guess opportunity is the best word for it. Just the number one opportunity that I feel like I get to be a part of yeah. for a coach or the number one thing that you're trying to create in people is that, you know, what we do just from a fitness and training standpoint is in itself surface level, but I found that it can be a gateway into a different way of understanding yourself yeah. and it gets people to start to start seeking to understand themselves and that opens up all these other areas and right. if you can if you can get away from um, some of the things that you feel like you're supposed to be and 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 start uh, just seeking to understand like we're not all ever gonna get there perfectly but just maintaining um, a curiosity and trying to discover some of what it is that you are deeper and beneath some of all these societal patterns that everyone picks up right. um that's that's it's everything you you hope to be able to begin in people because yeah. it's all you can do i mean, I mean it, it has to be a self-driven journey and you just hope that you can give them enough that they see the value in that and that they want to start on that type of a path right um and, and you, you it, know what the people you've worked with and the yeah, lives it's such you've a touched. beautiful opportunity to be able to do that for people and you I, i've had clients personal training clients that I've worked with who, you know, whose husbands, you know, you become friends with everybody kind of in their life a little bit and, you know, she'll give up everything but she won't give up her time with you, you know what I mean, like that type of stuff. Like you've made that kind of impact on them and the fitness and some of the things that they're learning about themselves through those workouts that you're putting them through. It's it's worth its weight in gold they, and they needed to have that experience with you, Justin, right. you know what I'm saying? Right. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's one, again, it's one of those times where you, you see it happening and you're like, Oh, I get to be a part of this right now. You know what I mean? And it's so much deeper than anything that we're going to do on a day to day basis. Yeah. Like, like it doesn't matter what I write in the program. Uh, just the time that we got to spend together sure. and, and just this whole new way of thinking about yourself yeah. that people develop is just, it's, it's the higher order stuff that, that come from or that, that, that can follow beginning kind of a, just a physical journey and you and you your listeners are gonna know this too because obviously the people that are gonna be drawn to this are gonna be fitness people your relationships you have with those folks i mean they tell you their deepest darkest secrets there's something that's happening yeah. in that setting where it's just letting people open up and just sort of shed off all the bullshit and maybe it's because you're pushing them into you know they're making them breathe hard and pushing them into pain and like they don't have time to wear all their masks they're just being real right. but i mean we get close to those folks really fast really and you fast. end up you end up getting the like kind of the true meat to who they are in, in in a very quick way unlike a lot of people i would say maybe maybe doctors who are dealing with someone who's like clinically like super sick right. they may get some authentic but we fitness people get to touch yeah. that better than anyone yeah you put someone in a state i mean it kind of goes back to what we're talking about like setting aside all of your crap like you 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 see people so often in a state where they're like unable to hang on to any of their crap right they have to put it down sure um and that's 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 so much more valuable than like any any number of reps and sets and all that kind of and stuff you think of remember i think of how many breakups you've helped people through and how many <laughs> right. you know what i'm saying like yeah, all that stuff yeah, like yeah. you get you get who they are from the beginning it's yeah. good it's good stuff absolutely um, all right, so the final the final piece is you know we we bookend it with the always something to work on, but always something to celebrate. Yeah. So, what is something in your personal journey that you want to celebrate? Something you're proud of, or just something that's come into your life that you want to express some some gratitude, and some celebration for? Uh, you know, I, I, you sit here and we talk about this stuff together, and you we put the story together because it's kind of just thing that's happening. It's just kind of unwinding as we go. Um, when I, I told you back when we were talking about the Qigong stuff and I was there that first night and I was in the parking lot and I had made that deal with myself that I was going to be willing to accept whatever my Sifu, Dr. Johnson, was going to say just for face value, you know what I mean? Um, I'm really happy that I haven't been so trapped dogmatically into things where I kind of gotten, I've created a barrier for myself to learn because uh, that's all I care about. I mean, 
you, you folks listening can't see it, but Justin can tell you behind me, there's literally hundreds of books behind me. I, I just constantly, there's seven or eight books on my desk right now. I'm reading all the time. Um, I've got probably, varied. Uh, yeah, very varied. Yeah, it's not just fitness stuff. Um, I've probably got 25 books going right now. All of them I'm reading into some pieces and just sort of getting what I need from them at the moment. But it's, I guess, the thing I would celebrate myself is I'm not, I've not gotten into my own way too much. I mean, I've lost friends and I've lost colleagues and stuff like that in the, in the strength world that I really, really cared about because I was willing to take these leaps that they weren't and they didn't like to see, they didn't like seeing the change in me that was inevitably going to happen when you start venturing out into these, these weird places and those relationships had to go, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's heartbreaking it was to lose those people. I gained such greater value by having those experiences. So if I'm celebrating anything, it's I'm really happy that I haven't been such a hard-headed jock where I've gotten in the way of an opportunity to learn something, especially if it didn't look on the onset as something that was going to have immediate carryover into what we were doing right now. You know what I mean? Yeah. David Weck's stuff is a perfect example. My Qigong stuff is a perfect example. Um, these are all things that are it's going to take somebody... You're going to have to take a breath and like really think hard, or am I really going to go do this? Because in Chris White, I'll tell you, when we drove down to see David Weck for the Weck Method stuff, part of me didn't want to go, and I've told David this. I was like, you know what? I'm really comfortable with what I do. We're good at what we do. I don't know if I need anything new. We're, we're having success. But we went anyway. Right. You know what I'm saying? And it was like, okay, here's another one of these times where I'm not going to pass judgment on the perceived situation. I'm just going to let it happen, and then we'll see if we're going to use it or not. Yeah. There have been some things that I've done that have been amazing, but I don't use any of it because I can't. Right. I have certifications in four or five different things that, given a different setting, would be useful, but here it just isn't. Right. And so it was one of these things where I saw it all the way through. It's great. Having the information is fantastic, but I can't use it right now because my setting doesn't allow us to. Right. And But I still went. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. I still got in the car and I went. I'm finishing my uh, NLP stuff, neuro linguistics programming yeah. stuff, yeah, and yeah. because of the whole how we speak yeah absolutely and building report all that stuff and I'm finishing a lot of that and a lot of the, the a lot of what we're working on right now with that is is all this change work that we talk about so it's almost like you know it's, it's like a psychology level therapist level stuff yeah, change psychology it, am I going to be able to use that here I don't know probably yeah. not yeah. but I'm a much better communicator as of taking it so there's something that's going to shine through you know what I mean so absolutely. to your listeners man just take a chance just yeah. be brave. Like, don't listen to what everybody else says. Just because everybody else is doing this doesn't mean if something that interests you is wrong. And just figure it out. See how, see if it works. And and if it doesn't, it doesn't. Move on to the next thing. Yeah. Awesome. Is there any parting words you want to leave with people or things you'd like them to check out? I just I just realized that we, you and I never really got into much of the David Weck stuff, although Chris and I talked about it Good. kind of at length. Yeah, listen and then to that also stuff. you've got your volley strength stuff to start in, yep. and we didn't even get into that. It's on my list also. Um, so side, maybe, side business maybe stuff. we'll have to come back and do a do a part two and okay. get into both of those two things. Okay. But I guess at the surface level, volley strength, is it just volleystrength.com? Just volleystrength.com, yeah. Yeah, it's um, uh, a youth volleyball training program, it is. essentially. Yes, um, and my, and the, the quick background on that, my wife's a hardcore volleyball person. She's been in the volleyball world forever, played um, professionally in Argentina. Like She's that person, and, and she's been a coach um, for as long as I've known her. And the club volleyball scene is a big part of our lives. And you know, working with youth, we are, we are getting more and more sedentary. And mm-hmm. with the athletes, they're showing up, young athletes are showing up with issues and injuries that... 50 and 60 year olds were the only ones that were showing up with those problems. So you've got 18 year olds that are having low back problems and chronic this and that. And you're like, holy cow, like you're 18. Why do you, why were you dealing with this? So volume strength, the idea behind it was putting together a very usable, very, um, low level investment in terms of equipment to get volleyball athletes prepared for their, their respective seasons, club, high school, and eventually into college. And there's a full body weight section. And there's a kettlebell section, and that's all it is. And it's programming that will carry them through their entire time. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Beautiful. Well, I uh, I always like to finish these things off with an acknowledgement for just just what I think you're bringing to the world, and um, especially especially with you for some of the things that you've brought to brought to my life. So, first of all, thanks for doing this. Of course, bro. And thank you for the the openness that you bring to your own exploration and being able to incorporate 
all of that, um, all of that other stuff, and really, really set your stuff aside to to be able to fully explore um, some 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 things that the value isn't always apparent in the beginning. Um, and then, lastly, I think it's come through so much in doing this, and you you alluded to it a little bit in you know what you have really picked up from Coach Bergner, but one of the things that was immediately apparent to me uh, the first time I met you and every time I see you in front of a group is just this, this natural draw and leadership and the way that you create an environment for us to work under you. There's just this, I mean, the only, the only thing that can come to mind is it's nurturing and it's not, it's not nurturing in a coddling way, but it's, it's just doing everything that you can to create an environment for everyone around you to thrive. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's just, it's, it's one of the most beautiful things that I've been a part of. And, you know, if, if at some point I had to be on the other side of the table and, and, and list all of the list, some of the special people that have, that have brought so much to my journey, you have to be at the, at the very top of that list. I appreciate it, bro. That's awesome. Um, Thank you. So this is, this has been a special interview for me. Um, thanks for doing this. Cool. Love you. Guys. Love you.